So in the world today, we have driverless cars on the road, we have artificial intelligence discovering new medicines, and we have, for the first time in the next five years, civilian tourist space flights to lunar orbit. Now, this is the power of technology. Technology allows us to do things that we once thought were impossible. And I come from the U.S., and when I'm back in the U.S., and I'm with my friends there, they discuss robots that follow you around and carry your luggage, and they talk about bionic legs that look like they're straight out of the, straight out of the latest Iron Man movie. And when I'm here in Tanzania and I'm with my friends, they talk about how they're not quite sure how they're going to make it through this month, but they're going to tough it out here in the city rather than go back to the village with their family. And that's because life in the village is hard. Most people farm. Farming is not easy. It often doesn't earn you a lot of money either. In fact, in Tanzania, 19 million people live below the poverty line, and 80% of those are on smallholder farms. So I have to ask, Where is the technology, the innovation, the robots and the machines for the smallholder farmers? Why are we closer to driverless cars than we are to effortless farms? It's been 180 years since John Deere invented the steel plow. It's been 100 years since, <laughs> since Henry Ford popularized the Fordson tractor. So where is all the innovation for the smallholder farmers? So I moved from the U.S. to Tanzania four years ago. And I was on a mission to solve the world's biggest problem of global poverty. And I didn't really know what I was doing, but I was very determined. And I had this idea that we could solve big problems like this by developing technologies. I wanted to build tools and innovate for smallholder farmers. So I got hired as a product designer, and I came to Tanzania, and I started working on a piece of equipment called a thresher. Now, if you don't know what threshing is, it's when you separate the grain from the rest of the plant. And on smallholder farms in Tanzania, typically how this is done is you harvest your grain, you put it on the ground, you get a stick, and you beat that grain with the stick over and over and over for hours or days or sometimes even weeks until all the grain falls off. And this is hard work. It's not easy, and it takes your time away from taking care of your farm. It takes your time away from spending it with your family. It takes your time away from doing other business. And it takes three hours to do a single sack of maize by hand. And I built a machine that does that in two minutes. Now, if you want to know the significance of three hours to two minutes, imagine I could either finish my talk now or you could listen to me talk for the rest of the day. <laughs> so I didn't invent a thresher. But what I did was I was designing one for Tanzania specifically. So we were using locally available materials. Metal that you could find here meant that you could repair this machine really easily. It meant that the lifespan was extended. But also, all the common grains that would be grown on a small farm in Tanzania could be processed in this single machine. And this is really what I had come to do. There was this problem of labor on small farms, and I solved it with this piece of technology, with this machine except it didn't really feel like I had done anything. So when I was building my first prototypes, I was speaking with farmers, and I quickly ran into this problem of affordability. I was trying to target people who might be subsistence farmers, and they might be earning as much an expendable income as this machine cost. So I thought, my technology works, but I'm running into this problem of affordability. So I decided maybe what I should do is I should innovate in my business model. And I decided to redefine who my customer was for this product. Instead of selling this to a smallholder farmer, I was going to sell it to someone with a motorcycle, so someone like this guy. Because if you can afford a motorcycle, you can afford my machine, and you can put the machine on the motorcycle, and you can drive this machine from farm to farm to farm, run it as a business, and save labor for the farmers in your community. And for him, it's a good business, it brings money in. For everyone else, they're saving time. I had to be thinking about those two groups of people when I was designing my product. I had the problem of affordability, but it wasn't so much how cheap can I make this, it was how quickly can this guy make his money back. So he made it really powerful, made it so he could process more grain in a short amount of time, and made it more portable so he could get to more farms easier, spread that impact further. And I was getting a lot of really positive feedback on this model, both from my customers and also from the end users, the smallholder farmers. 
And now my model looked like this. I had this problem of labor on farms that I wanted to solve, and I solved it with a piece of technology. And then there was this problem of affordability, and I was solving it by redefining who my customer was. And I thought, this is it. This is my solution.、Um, all I have to do now is bring this everywhere. And what's so hard about that? So I had an idea. I was going to make threshers. I was going to sell those threshers, and then I was going to use that money to make more threshers, and I would continue in this way until everyone everywhere had a thresher. Except this was much more much more difficult than I thought it was going to be. In fact, I wasn't the first person to be in this position before. So I want to show you a picture that I took one of the first times I came to Tanzania, and that's not my machine, and that's not my customer. So. I thought I had something really cool, and admittedly I did, and I do. But it maybe wasn't as new as I hoped it was. As I hoped it was. And I might argue that my thresher was designed better. It was a better product. I was more considerate of the users that I was building for. But does that really make a difference? You see, mediocre products. Go to market every day. Mediocre products get bought and sold every day. Mediocre products get used every day, but threshers don't. So why is that? What makes this business so hard and so different than anything else? And I spent the next two years of my, of my two, next two years of my life asking myself that question.、Um, So I was very new to business, and when you start a business, you have to map out everything about your business. You have to plan what you're doing, when you're doing, where you're doing it, who's doing it, how much money you're spending. And I came across this problem of how was I actually going to supply enough threshers to reach 19 million smallholder farms in Tanzania? And this became my new critical big problem. This became the new thing that kept me up at night and that challenged me every day. I'm going to explain to you why this is such a critical problem, but first we'll talk about toothbrushes. So this is a graph that I call the seasonal demand for toothbrushes. As you can see, it's flat, and people use toothbrushes the same day today that they use it tomorrow, that they used it yesterday, and so on. It's predictable, and businesses know this, and they can operate on this. Now, not all products are like this. So here's a graph that I call the seasonal demand for cars. And it's not flat anymore. It's now wavy. That's because some times of the year people buy more cars than they buy other times of the year. And this is a harder problem. Toyota is famous for their production model, which really solves this problem. Now let's look at the seasonal demand for threshers. And it looks like this. And the reason it looks like this is because there's only one time a year that a thresher is useful during the harvest season. Maybe you get two. But in most places, it's one, and so people don't buy threshers the rest of the year. They only buy it right before they need it. And what that means as a business is you actually have a very short window of opportunity where you are doing business, and the rest of the year you're not. Now that window of opportunity is coming around, and probably what you're going to do is you're going to size your market. You're going to predict how many threshers will I sell during that short window, and you'll buy your threshers. You have to do that in advance. And when the harvest comes around, you hope that you sell them all, because any mistake you make is an expensive mistake. You can't fix it for another year. But what makes this problem even more difficult is that the curve doesn't really look like this. The curve looks more like this. It could be really high. It could be really low. You don't know. No one knows. You see, income in rural communities is so closely tied to the success of the harvest. So. Your customers themselves aren't quite sure if they're going to be able to afford this product until that harvest hits. So, if you want to know what I think makes this business so hard, why I think that products, agricultural machines, don't make it to market, I think it's because of this. It's because of this seasonal, unpredictable, fluctuating demand. And whether, when you're a business, whether you're selling the world's most mediocre thresher or the world's Most overdesigned thresher. You have to find a business that works with this. You have to find a business that can afford to make expensive mistakes all the time, and that's really hard. So now I'm going to share with you how my business plans to solve this problem. 
So I think many of you might be familiar with a picture that looks like this. It's a small metalworking workshop called Juakali, the fierce sun in Swahili. And I have a five-minute walk to work, and I pass about 10 of these shops because they're everywhere. And small workshops like this are where my team and I built our first products for our first market pilots. And actually, small workshops like this is how I plan to supply enough threshers to reach 19 million farms to work with that seasonal fluctuating demand. And this is how it works. So my production model is that I contract a network of small metalworking workshops to produce my products. So if we imagine that we're going into business together, and we are going to sell threshers, and so. The harvest season comes around, and it's a great harvest. Everyone did really well that year. You found a new ripe market. People are excited about your product. Everyone wants to buy, and it's your biggest order ever. So what do you do? Well, you contract all of your workshops. Okay, but then the next year comes around, the next harvest season, and there was a drought that year. Things aren't looking so good. People don't have the money to buy your product. Okay, you have fewer orders than ever. But it's fine. You just contract fewer workshops. So the thing with this production model is, it doesn't matter what that demand curve looks like. If it's really high, if it's really low, if it's very seasonal, this model works with it. It's high capacity when it needs to be, and it's low capacity, low cost when it needs to be. So now everything looks like this. I had this problem of labor on farms, and I thought I'm going to solve it with this piece of technology. With this thresher machine, and then I had this problem of affordability, and I decided I'm going to solve this by redefining my customer. And then I had this problem of how am I going to supply enough threshers to reach the farms that I want to reach? And I won't say that I've solved this yet, but ask me in a year, and I'm confident about my answer. So you can see that when I look at my journey, it started out as being a journey about technology. Innovation and technology, but it quickly became something very different. It quickly became about innovation in business models, innovation in the supply chain. And I'm still working on this. I'm still on my journey, and I know that every day I'm uncovering new problems. I'm learning about distribution. I'm learning about financing. I'm learning about sales. I'm thinking about servicing. And if I have any hope to tackle those problems as I learn about them. I'm going to need to innovate in those. What I've learned is that there is no magic bullet solution to the problems that I want to solve. There is no single piece of technology, whether it is a phone app or a robot or a thresher, that is going to solve the kind of problems that I care about. Technology is one piece of the puzzle. So I need to expand my idea of what innovation is, to go beyond what technology is, to think about these other things. And I'll leave you with this, and it's that in the world of product design right now, there's this idea that the most important part of the design process is to understand the problem that you're solving. And once you understand that problem, then all the innovation magic happens. But how do you begin to understand a problem as big and complex as labor on farms or global poverty or these other things that have plagued us forever? I don't know, and I'm one of many people working on problems like this one, and no one has solved them yet. So no one can tell you this is what you have to do. But if you want my advice, I would say start with what you know. Start with a small slice of the problem. Start with a piece of technology. Start with a business model, and then go from there. Build your understanding of the problem, and as you go, let that innovation magic happen. Thank you.